reading from the selected works of James Begg on worship, and we're considering uh, uh, his stuff against organs, and then we've come to an appendix. This is a, the first appendix, and then we're in the middle of it. And I'll read this today. What these centers are and what the crimes against which they are directed is easily to be learned from the constitution of every church. And whoever believes its censures to be too severe or to be, or its known orders and laws to be, in many respects, iniquitous, so that in conscience he cannot comply with them, ought to beware of involving himself in sin by entering into it. Or if he hath rashly joined himself, he is bound, as an honest man and a good Christian, to withdraw and to keep his conscience pure and undefiled. But on the other hand, if a judicature, which is appointed to be the guardian and defender of the laws and orders of the society, shall absolve them who break those laws from all censure, and by such a deed encourage and invite to future disobedience, we conceive it will be found that they have exceeded their powers and betrayed their trust in the most essential instance. Number three. Because we conceive the sentence of the commission to be not only inconsistent with church government in general, he's talking about a commission that they had that basically let these guys off the hook that were wanted organs in the church, but in a particular manner inconsistent with Presbyterian church government, which we have acknowledged to be founded upon and agreeable to the word of God, the two capital articles by which Presbytery is distinguished from every other ecclesiastical constitution are the parity of its ministers and the subordination of its judicatures. In other words, you've got General Assembly, Synods, Presbyteries, Sessions. By the one, the Church is preserved from exercising that lordship and domination over our brethren which is condemned by our Savior, and which is inconsistent with that liberty with which Christ hath made us free. Luke 22.25, Galatians 5.1 By the other, we guard against that anarchy and confusion which is the unavoidable consequence of the independent system. Our church, therefore, may well boast that our government is, of all others, the most consistent with the natural freedom and equality of our members, considered either as men or as Christians. But it is an undoubted maxim that the more free any constitution is, with the more exactness should its orders and systems be preserved. As great liberty will always encourage subjects to presume, so it should teach governors to watch with double vigilance. Vigilance. Wherever there is a subordination of courts, there is one that must be supreme, for subordination were in vain if it did not terminate in some last resort. We do not pretend to vest any court with infallibility, but we cannot help being surprised that any of our brethren should have been at loss to conceive this plain and obvious principle that it is essential to the very idea of a supreme judicature that its decision should be absolute and final. Such a supreme judicature by our constitution is the general assembly of the church and therefore if the decisions of the general assembly may be disputed and disobeyed by inferior courts with impunity we apprehend the presbyterian constitution to be entirely overturned there is no occasion for this church to meet in the general assemblies anymore our government is at an end it totters from the very basis and we are exposed to the contempt and scorn of the world as a church without union order or discipline destitute of strength to support its own constitution, falling into ruin by the abuse of liberty. Our wiser ancestors took the proper steps to guard against such dangers. They established solemn subscription and engagements to bind the ministers of the church to obedience and submission to its judicatures, which engagements, as they continue to this day, we hardly wish were more attended to and regarded. By the formula which all ministers subscribe to at their ordination, they solemnly promise, quote, to assert, maintain, and defend the doctrine worship and discipline discipline and government of this church by Kirk Sessions, Presbyteries, Provincial Councils, and General Assemblies. In their practice to conform themselves to the said worship to, and to submit to the said discipline and government and never to endeavor directly or indirectly the prejudice and subversion of the same. They promise to follow no divisive course from that present establishment of the church, renounce all tenets, doctrines, and opinions whatsoever contrary to the, or inconsistent with the said doctrine, worship, and discipline, or government of the church, end of quote. Now see, that's strict subscriptionism right there, which we talked about this morning. To the same purpose as the fifth article of the engagement with ministers death or ordination come under before the whole congregation, quote, you promise to submit yourself willingly and humbly in the spirit of meekness, under the admonitions of the brethren of this presbytery and to be subject to them and all other presbyteries and superior judicators of this church where God and his providence shall cast your lot. And that according to your power, you shall maintain that unity and peace of this church against error and schism, notwithstanding 
of whatsoever trouble or persecution may arise, and that you follow no divisive courses from the present established doctrine, worship, discipline, and government of the church. End of quote. Once again, strict subscriptionism. Such are the engagements to obedience and submission with this church lays upon her members. And these are general principles of subordination and obedience she hath explained and asserted in the strongest terms, so often as there was any apprehension of danger from licentious principles. About a hundred years ago, the same anti-constitutional maxims, which were advanced to support the sentence of which we complain, were brought into this kingdom by English sectaries, or by certain persons who, living amongst us, had imbibed their principles and endeavored to import them into our church. But to give a timely check by their progress, the assembly, quote, appointed some brethren to prepare articles and propositions for vindication of the truth against the dangerous tenets of racinism and independency, falsely called liberty of conscience. And when these propositions were exhibited, A.D. 1647, they unanimously approved of this, among others, quote, that the lesser and inferior ecclesiastical assemblies ought to be subordinate and subject of the greater and superior assemblies, end of quote. Now, this declaration, which we humbly conceive, is a decision in point, and to which spirit insists in the Presbyterian government, the sentence of the commission is manifestly repugnant. And therefore, we doubt not but that the assembly, the venerable assembly, would justify our dissent, and we will find that the commission have exceeded their powers. Once again, if you don't remember, he's talking about a commission that basically came in and left it sessions at liberty. You know, hey, if you want to use instruments, yeah, go ahead which is in violation of strip subscriptionism. Number four, because the sentence of the commission, as it is, in our, is our, in our opinion, is contrary to the principles, so it is inconsistent and with the uniform practice and procedure of the Presbyterian Church, our judicatures have long ago not only asserted the general principles of subordination and obedience, but have expressed a proper degree of displeasure with these principles uh, when these principles were trampled upon. It were easy to show that in every period of the church, censures of all kinds, from the highest to the lowest, have been inflicted upon the undutiful and disobedient. <clears throat> we shall only take notice of one instance, which will demonstrate, with what a different spirit, how much more consistently with Presbyterian principles our ancestors exercised discipline, in a case that falls under the, general, the same general rules of the behavior of the Presbytery of Dumfermline. The case is found in the Unprincipled Acts of Assembly 1646, Mr. James Morrison being suspended by the Presbytery of Kirkwall, his immediate superiors did appeal to the General Assembly, and in the meantime, notwithstanding his suspension, continued in the exercise of his ministerial function, for which the Presbytery deposed him. Yet he, adhering to his appeal, went on and preached. The matter coming before the General Assembly, they find, quote, that the Presbytery hath not, upon sufficient grounds, suspended the said Mr. James Morrison, end of quote. Notwithstanding their condemning the sentences of the Presbytery, it is very remarkable that they found at the same time, quote, that the said Mr. James was contumacious in that he did not give obedience to the Presbytery in forbearing to preach during the time of his suspension, as also in preaching upon his disposition. They therefore appointed the moderator to reprehend him sharply in the face of the assembly for his contempt and disobedience and ordain him to humbly to humble himself before the Presbytery and acknowledge humbly his offense for said and his sorrow for the same. And in the meantime, repone him again for the full exercise and benefit of his ministry. Uh, end of quote. In other words, uh, you're in a Presbytery. Your Presbytery does something that's clearly unscriptural, that violates scripture, that's definitely wrong. While you appeal that to the General Assembly, you basically have to keep your mouth shut and submit uh, outwardly to what they say until the General Assembly makes a decision. If the General Assembly backs an unbiblical decision or something doctrine that's unbiblical, you have to separate from that denomination. You can't stay. But while you're appealing, you have to, you have to keep your mouth shut. At the same time, they appointed the Presbytery of Kirkwall to be rebuked for their unjust suspension of Mr. Morrison. Yet they by no means con condemn the sentence of disposition which Presbytery had pronounced against him for his disobedience to their sentence of suspension. <clears throat> the whole of this procedure it is worthy of the assembly convened in what is justly called the pure and reforming age of our church. So it appears to us to be warranted by justice agreement to the general maxims of government and founded upon the essential principles of the Presbyterian system. In that age, our judicatures were particularly attentive to the preservation of order and the subordination of the church. 
The same torrent of licentious principles which, in England, bore down before all ecclesiastical government were ready to break upon us. And let me just make another comment. Uh, during the 1700s in the United States of America, the Presbyterian Church in the USA, it wasn't called that yet. Uh, I forget what it was called at that time. PCUS something. Uh, the practice of exclusive psalmody, which is taught in the Westminster Standards, which is part of the Directory of Worship, uh, was basically neglected during the 1700s, and churches weren't disciplined for violating that principle, which is part of the standards. And instead of doing what the General Assembly of Scotland did and dealing with it properly, in rebuking it and correcting it, they basically just got to the point where so many churches had adopted the corrupt way of worshiping that they basically changed their directory for worship, allowing for uninspired hymns. They basically submitted the declension rather than forcing the issue which, of course, is cowardice, unbiblical, and unworthy of ministers and elders. Continuing. <clears throat> the whole of this procedure is worthy of some to convene is what he just called the pure and reforming age of the church. In that age, our judiciaries were pretty attentive to the preservation of order and subordination of the church. The same torrent of licentious principles, which in England had borne down before all ecclesiastical government, was ready to break in upon us. Our church saw and dreaded its approach. She bewails the increase of dangerous tenets, particularly of independency, and that which is called by the abuse of the word liberty of conscience. Okay, this is how they argued for allowing for diversity of doctrine and church government and so forth, saying, well, that's just liberty of conscience. You can't force me to believe what I don't believe. Well, that's a, a abuse of the term liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience means you're free from the doctrines and commandments of men. You're free to adhere to what the scriptures teach. It doesn't mean that you can adhere to any error you want and just simply say, well, I'm okay because I have liberty of conscience, which is how that's generally used today. <clears throat> as the same error seemed to be again revived as the dangerous tenets of independency spread fast and have all appeared infected some of our own members, we do humbly conceive that it would have been become the reverend commission rather to have imitated the vigor of our forefathers in, in supporting the Presbyterian discipline and government. Then by this unprecedented sentence to have given admittance and promised impunity to the most unconstitutional tenets and practices. Number five. Because we conceive the sentence not only encourages disobedience, encourages disobedience to the decisions, but will justify any contradiction to the doctrines of the church, it belongs to every ecclesiastical constitution to have some common standard to which its members are required to conform in order to preserve unity of doctrine and uniformity of faith and worship. Accordingly, every minister and elder of this church is obliged to acknowledge and subscribe our confession of faith, and whoever hath at the same time publicly departed from, the, from or denied the form of the sound words therein contained not only become liable, but actually felt the censures of the church. But if the church for the future shall follow the precedent set, set them by the commission and shall adopt the reasonings which were used to vindicate the sentence complained of, the outcome of our standards may be deserted and contradicted with the greatest impunity. He's talking about loose subscriptionism. If any minister of the church shall think proper to espouse and publish the most wild, erroneous, and hurtful opinions, let him only declare that it was a conscientious regard to the will of Christianity, according to the best of his understanding of it, that led him to this opinion. Let him say that he is persuaded his notions are agreeable to the will of the Lord, of which every man has an unalienable right to judge for himself. Okay, that's their abuse of liberty of conscience. As he shall be answerable to the Lord. And then, according to the declared principles of most of the brethren who voted for this sentence, quote, no assembly of fallible men can encroach upon his rights or stretch their power so far as to inflict any censure. End of quote. Annals of the Church of Scotland, 1739 to 1766. Appendix number two. Is the established church legally entitled to the use of organs or to alter its worship? This is a very important question, which every man called upon to pay one farthing towards the support of the Scottish establishment is entitled to raise, which probably the sooner it is raised and settled in a court of law, the better. The following opinion was given upon the subject many years ago by uh, Mr. Reedy, town clerk of Glasgow, in connection with the struggle in that city, which ended in the defeat of the organists in 1806, 1807, and 1808. Mr. Reddy was one of the soundest and ablest lawyers of his day, and the law has, of course, remained unaltered since. It is quite clear uh, against the legality of any such right, insofar as the change is introduced by any power short of a general assembly, and in accordance with the concurrent opinion of the whole church. 
If the whole church were to sanction the, char the change, he would in that case think it favorably of its legality. But the grounds of that idea is not stated, and we may safely defy any one of the one to state them. It is pretty evident that if the church established and regulated by statute has power to alter her worship in any essential particular, so as to virtually, in fact, to make it a totally different church, the most serious results might follow. Meantime, the supposed state of the case has not yet arisen, and on the actual case, as then and now occurring, he is quite clear, and this is all the more remarkable, as his own private opinion was in favor of organ worship. So I may imagine that the mind of the whole church has been expressed on the subject since the last General Assembly authorized Presbyterians to act in a matter, uh, in the case of unanimous, con unanimous congregations, and in accordance with this authority, some of the organs have actually been introduced. But this is only a manifestation of ignorance. Whatever the intention of the last General Assembly and their bungling and incompetent enactment, they had no power, in any case, to give authority to presbyteries to sanction organs, or indeed to do anything in regard to such a serious matter without sending their proposal down to presbyteries under the Barrier Act. In other words, this is what's amazing about this book, which is you know 130 years old, over 130 years old, is this is how things operate today. When a, there's declension in a church and the worship is corrupted, what men say is, well, we're going to leave it up to presbyteries to decide, or we're going to leave it up to individual sessions to decide what they want to do. So, in the PCA, some church, in the OPC, some churches have paid a communion. Others don't. It's up to the local session. And that's not Presbyterianism. That's Congregationalism. That's Independency. The proceedings of the magistrates of Glasgow in former times in taking a legal opinion before allowing the introduction of an organ into one of their churches contrasted, we may say, very favorably with those of their successors in the present day who have incurred a very serious responsibility by encouraging the innovators. But again, we say, let the matter by all means be brought to a legal issue, and the sooner the better. Let a subscription be immediately raised for trying this question by interdict or otherwise, either in Glasgow or Edinburgh, or in any country parish where the mischief exists. This would put the whole established church at once upon its defense. And let us see whether the security of the revolution settlement is really so utterly worthless as some of the innovators are disposed to think. Now, we have differences with the Revolution Settlement, but at least they settled on biblical worship, and it was a settled issue. If it be found that, as one of their organists alleges, the church may adopt any form of worship she pleases, it is high time to consider whether such a dangerous liberty is to be allowed to remain. In other words, whether the bargain to pay on the side of the people is tamely to be constrained now that the supposed condition of the other side is found to have no existence. The keeping up of the establishment on such a footing would be a monstrous folly in the part of the Scottish people. And that's um, from copy of the opinion of Mr. Reddy, town clerk of Glasgow, on the introduction of organs into the Church of Scotland, September 6, 1806, Glasgow. Here's what he says. Oh, no, that this is what he says now. My Lord, I have perused and deliberately considered the petition of a number of the most respectful inhabitants who possess seats in St. Andrew's Church, requesting the permission of the magistrates and council to introduce an organ into the, that church. I have also perused the letter of the Reverend Dr. Ritchie transmitted to your lordship along with a petition. Agreeably to the direction of our lordship and other magistrates, I shall now, as briefly as I can, state what occurs to me on this subject, and I have no doubt whatever resolution that the magistrates and council may ultimately adopt, that they will be guided by our views at once liberal and prudent, and that the ground on which they proceed will be such as to com command the respect of their fellow citizens and of their country. Were I called upon to express my own individual opinion and feeling, I should perhaps lay claim to the honor of participating in the sentiments and wishes of the enlightened congregation at St. Andrew's Church. In other words, he actually likes organs. But in the subject, my individual opinion is a matter of no importance whatsoever. It is my opinion as one of the legal assessors of the city of Glasgow that your lordship and other magistrates require. In the petition in that of Dr. Ritchie's letter, it seems to be hinted at that the magistrates and council have the power of granting or refusing the present application, quote, merely on the ground of expediency or inexpedience as to the removal of the seats in the church. End of quote. With me, this opinion has no weight because I do not conceive it to be warranted by the law of the land. Of the present application, the magistrates and councils, the council has a right to judge in two characters, as representative heritors and as civil magistrates. As heritors, they have the legal right to insist that their patrimonial interests shall not be impaired by the proposed measure. These patrimonial interests, the gentlemen of the magistrate and council might, perhaps on such an occasion, be disposed to waive. 
were they inheritors in their own personal right. But the members of the Magistrate and Council are not inheritors in their own right. They are inheritors merely as representing the community of Glasgow. And to the interest of that community, they are bound on this, as on all other occasions, to attend. Whatever resolution, there, therefore, may be ultimately adopted, it will be necessary that due precautions be taken to secure effectually the pecuniary interest of that community. But there is another and more personal and more important character in which your lordship and the gentlemen of the magistrate are called upon to the judge to present of the present application, I mean as civil magistrates, that there is an express act of the legislature prohibiting the use of organs in our established churches, I am not aware, but that the introduction of organs into our churches would be a material alteration and innovation of our external mode of worship, there cannot be a doubt. The argument which would identify an organ with a pitch pipe does not merit a serious answer. Whether the use of organs in our established churches would be an expedient or an inexpedient measure in a religious and ecclesiastical view is unnecessary here to inquire, because your lordship and other magistrates are not uh, an ecclesiastical judiciature and have no right to take cognizance of the matter of the, in that character. But as civil magistrates, you are legally bound to maintain our constitution in church and state in its present condition. And by express statute, you are bound, quote, to take order that unity and peace be preserved in the church, end of quote. If there is a great danger of the introduction of organs distributing the peace and interrupting the harmony of the Church of Scotland, I should be sorry to suppose. At the same time, such an event is possible. Whether for the articular gratification of one congregation, ground of offense should be afforded to other congregations is a matter that requires serious thought. Some respect is due by the civil magistrates, even to what may, many individuals may be disposed to term the prejudice of their weaker brethren. And at all events, if any innovation in our external mode of worship be expedient and salutary, the reform or improvement ought to be originate with the ecclesiastical branch of the government, with the constitutional guardians of our conduct and our work, welfare in such matters. When the use of organs in our established churches has been sanctioned by our ecclesiastical legislature, then it will be the duty of your lordship and other magistrates not merely to permit the use of these musical instruments, but to protect in that, they, in that use of these instruments who may conceive such instruments to minister to their edification. Till the ecclesiastical branch of the Constitution has sanctioned the use of organs in our established churches, I do not see that the magistrates and council can, with any propriety, directly or indirectly, approve of such an ecclesiastical innovation. I have been told that the only way in which this matter can be brought before ecclesiastical judiciaries is by a complaint and interdict. Okay, in other words, what he's saying is, look, if you want instruments in, mute, in worship, you have to bring a paper to Presbytery. Well, first you would bring it to your session, get the session to approve it, then have the session bring it to the Presbytery, get the Presbytery to approve it, and then the Presbytery would approve it and then pass it on to the gen to, to uh, in Scotland at the time, it would be the, the local synod, and then the local synod would have to approve it, and then it would go to the General Assembly. The General Assembly would have to approve it, and then it would have to be voted on, like in the RPC, and it would be, have to be approved by two-thirds of the ch individual churches as well. <clears throat> but I'm much mistaken, indeed, if our establishment be so grossly defective as to not, as not to afford some way sufficiently formal of obtaining the permission or sanction of our ecclesiastical legislature for what might be expedient alteration in our mode of worship. From the language of the petition, it seems to be supposed that there were not magistrates and council heritors of St. Andrew's Church. The subscribers might, in their own authority, solely introduce an organ. In this opinion, I cannot coincide. To the happiness and glory of this nation, every man may worship God as he thinks fit. But while unlimited toleration prevails in this country, we have at the same time an ecclesiastical establishment recognized by law. Under that establishment, a certain mode of worship is, is and has been for ages observed. And to that mode of worship, until altered by constitutional authority, whatever dissenters may do, the members of the establishment are bound to conform. In former times, the inheritors of Glasgow stood forward to steady supporters of civil and religious freedom, and although firmly attached to the simple and unadorned form of worship handed down to them by their forefathers, I am convinced the gentlemen who at present compose the magistrates and council are, at least, as anxious as any of their predecessors ever were, to promote every rational and liberal improvement. But zeal for improvement ought to be tempered with prudence, and I, and I own, I should be very sorry indeed for the magistrates in the city... Council of Glasgow to commit themselves so far as to sanction, authorize, or approve in any capacity, directly or indirectly, expressly or tacitly, what is possible that the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in the exercise of its constitutional functions may afterwards disapprove and prohibit. Upon the whole, then, my opinion is first. 
that the magistrates and council as representative inheritors are bound to take such measures as may prevent the funds of the community from sustaining any injury by the introduction of the proposed organ. And secondly, that the magistrate and council ought to recommend it to the gentlemen subscribers and to the able and learned pastor of that most respectful congregation before proceeding further to apply for the permission and sanction of the established branch of, the, of our Constitution. If the measure be expedient and salutary, there will surely be less difficulty in obtaining that sanction. And whatever may be the result, the measure will be fully and fairly discussed by that deliberative assembly whose providence it is to take cognizance of such matters. I have to apologize for trespassing so, so much on the time of your lordship, and I have the honor to be, with much respect and esteem, my lord, your lordship's faithful servant, signed James Reddy. So you see, uh, that may sound weird to our modern ears, but uh, that is the way an establishment ought to work. The state has no authority in ecclesiastical matters whatsoever. It is to simply uphold what the church has already declared. And their mode of worship goes back, you know, to the 1550s. And this is the 1800s. Number three, appendix number three, expensive musical instruments for churches and how this is sometimes defrayed strange procedures in New South Wales. One of the difficulties in the way of securing and maintaining organs as worship, as Dean Ramsey hints, is the large necessary expense incurred by those who indulge in them and the landlords and people of Scotland may make up their minds to this, that if organs and other expensive things are to be used in the Traveris churches, they will ultimately be forced to meet the expense. You have to understand that organs weren't electric back then. Organs were these giant pipe organs that were extremely expensive. It was made by passing wind through giant pipes. It was not by simply electrical, like modern organs, the Hammond B3 and so forth as John Lord of Deep Purple would well know. The, partial, the present partial introduction of organs is purely tentative, and if people are prepared to tolerate, they will soon be compelled to pay. History proves that the expense of the prelatical system has more to do with its exclusion from Scotland in former times, insofar as the heritors were concerned than in any other cause. As old Braxfield said, no doubt expressing a general feeling, the Scottish Church, the Scot Church was founded on the rock of purity because it stood on the rock of poverty and the landlords had no objection to the d dumb dogs that could not bark, so long as they were not also the greedy dogs who never said it was enough. When Charles I sent down the commissioners to persuade the Scottish nobility to give up portions of their church lands for the use of the bishops, they determined to offer the most violent resistance to this aspect of the question, and one of them, a blind man, desired to be placed next to one of the commissioners. Then he might dispatch him with his dagger, if no other argument prevailed. <laughs> The affair looked so threatening that the commission ne was never opened. The noblemen kept their lands and, the, and remained zealous covenanters till the danger was passed. Matters are now assuming a similar aspect, only with less general intelligence on the part of those who will ultimately be forced to pay the cost. In the Liverpool Presbyterian congregation, if we remember aright, the poor minister had been so zealous for the organ, found that the organist a very heavy charge on the funds of the congregation whilst his own stipend was rather inadequate. The case ended him for rather sadly. When men, however, are determined to gratify their own desires for sensuous worship, they are not apt to be very scrupulous as to the means employed, and thus one evil leads to another, and the leaven of corruption spreads. Still, we were scarcely prepared for the extraordinary scenes which seem lately to have occurred in connection with the introduction and expense of instrumental music in the Presbyterian Church of New South Wales, scenes which are fitted to bring all religious in, religion into contempt, we quote from a paper called The Testimony, published at Sydney, and from the number dated January 1866. Quote, Our readers learned some time ago that, it, that a harmonium was introduced, and how it was introduced in the Presbyterian congregation of Glen, I, Glen Inns. We have now to inform them that the instrumental music, having taken that ill-defended outpost of Presbyterianism to the north, pushed on to Tamworth, the Presbyterian congregation of which it once surrendered. The result, the raising of funds to carry out the intended innovation present, presented some difficulty. But happily, this difficulty was not insurmountable. If funds could not be raised, and it seems they could not, by means that it would be quite in keeping with the character of the church to employ, why, they could be raised by means that it, the, ha the happy, respectful sanction of the world. Means, too, which were attended with a great advantage that the use of them conveyed a compl compliment and afforded gratification to the world would secure its cooperation. 
According to Tamsworth, Presbyterians are a majority of them adopted means of this latter class. They got up an amateur Ethiopian entertainment, which proved a great success. We gave the following account of it from the Tamworth Examiner. Quote, the entertainment was begun by the reading of a short prologue written by for the occasion when the, in quotation marks, niggers appeared. That's their expression, not mine. We would say African Americans appeared. And were greeted with hearty applause. We do not propose to go through the whole of the program, but will simply indicate that portions of it which were most warmly applauded or that were mo more especially well rendered. We may place in the first rank the nervous cures, which were done to the perfection by Bones and Tony and elicited as it richly deserved a burst of applause and encore. Next were the stump speech and the sensation song of Romeo, which were both well received, the local hits in the former being very good. Tony's ballad was also exceedingly ludicrous, and the makeup and dress, and in others we have mentioned, could not have been approved upon. The duet, Silver Moonlight Winds, was splendidly rendered, the expression being perfect, an incident frequently wanting, but one of the most charming features in ballad singing. Gone of the Days was very tenderly sung, and the choruses in several of the songs were very well executed. The concert concluded with an exceptionally comic affair entitled Billy Patterson, which was admirably given. The accompaniments were very fairly played. Altogether, this concert has been the most successful that has been taken place here, and with better accompaniment for the audience, with a proper room having been secured which to hold them. We hope our amateurs will gain favor with us and one another. The sum realized must be considerable and will go a long way to pay for that harmonium. You'll probably object, reader, with old-fashioned puritanical strictness to the employment of such means to procure for the celebration of the worship of God, but you must remember that this is a liberal age. Means are not to be too curiously and squeamishly inspected. The end is the thing. It would not be safe to say from the odium and attachment to the statement that the end justifies the means but still it affects not a little in that direction. The answer may not satisfy you, reader, but we hope it does not, etc. And we'll stop there, but <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just so sad. Uh, you know, here's James Begg. He lived from 1808 to 1883, which is quite a long time for the 1800s. A uh, very godly man, a very dedicated man to purity of worship. And we see that the... Uh, the unpresbyterianism of how things occurred, uh, the way things occurred without biblical argumentation, without biblical proof, without really the approval of synod and general assembly first, uh, these things happened in America too. And uh, it did get, uh, such procedures are, are just downright unpresbyterian and unscriptural. And, and of course, once you have corruption of worship, it's really hard to get rid of. People love their organs, people love their pianos, people love their rock and roll bands and all that. I love music more than anyone else. I love a good organ solo. I love Emerson Lake and Palmer and, and Shades of Deep Purple, Deep Purple, excellent organ player, John Lord. Um, but it doesn't belong in the church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for our beloved brother James Begg. We th hope that his works are read more and more and taken seriously. And uh, we thank you for his ministry. We pray, Lord, that there will be reformation so that all the Romish trinkets and trash that have come in Reformed churches will be removed, especially organs, especially holy days such as Christmas and Easter, and especially man-made hymns, which have no part of the public worship of God. In Jesus' name, amen.